Hey, welcome back to the 69 pillars, the 69 frameworks, the 69 mindsets, ultimately the 69 principles that are going to lay the foundation of success in your life and help you accelerate toward it. Today, I want to talk about a really important principle, a really important facet that we need to have in our lives if we ever want to see success in any area, whether it's relationships, it's career, it's our own personal, uh, physical or emotional health, maybe even just our general happiness. And today's principle is really the principle of acceptance. I had a mentor say this to me several years ago, and when she first shared it with me, I kind of bucked at the idea. And she said this, acceptance is the key to my freedom. And I was like, don't you need to understand something? Like if you're trying to get free from a thing or free from a circumstance, maybe you're in a crappy job that you really don't like or you're in a bad relationship, how is accepting that this thing is bad really going to help me get free? Isn't freedom really predicated upon either my ability to change this job or this person, you know, bad thinking, <laughs> or being able to change myself to adapt to it? Or being able to just change the circumstance altogether and get away from it isn't my freedom in getting away from the thing, not accepting it. And what she really had to school me on over the course of a longer time than I care to admit was that you're not accepting that a situation that you don't like or a person that you don't like or some aspect of your life, you're not accepting those things in the way that you're thinking this is the way it should be. You're just accepting it for how it is. You know, like if you've ever been through or known anyone that's been through like a 12 step program, one of the steps is always accepting that you actually have a problem because once you accept it, or in this case, if you look at the definition of acceptance, it's really believing that a certain fact or an opinion or a situation is true. Right? That's what acceptance really means. It's believing that the information that's in front of me is true. So if a person's going through some type of recovery, for example, they have to accept first that they have a problem that they need to recover from if they're ever going to be able to recover from it. And that's really what I want to drive home today with the stories that I'm telling, with the principles that we're sharing, is so much of our life and the things that we want to change, right? If we're not successful in an area of our life, again, career, relationships, whatever it is, I can almost guarantee you that to some degree that lack of success and ultimately that lack of happiness is based upon the fact that there's something about the situation that you just haven't accepted as the reality. And for example, I coach a lot of people on social media, right? How to build a social media presence, how to build a brand, how to attract clients, uh, how to sell products, whatever it is. I help businesses and entrepreneurs and even people use social media to do those things. And inevitably, a good number of the people that I coach come to these platforms with certain expectations certain ways that they want the platform to behave to serve them and their needs and their goals this has been especially true in my experience with the youtube platform which has been through a lot of changes over the year so i get these creators that once upon a time may have even seen some level of success several years ago and then when things changed and they did on the platform that success started to dwindle and even for some of the folks that i've worked with that success evaporated and so what they're left struggling with is, I remember how it used to be back in the day. It was a lot of fun. I had a lot of success. And I had a great time building that success. But today it's not as much fun. Audi the audience isn't the same. The way that the YouTube platform promotes my content isn't the same, if it promotes the content at all. And inevitably, with these creators, what I have to help them come to grips with is accepting those things. It's accepting, yes, the audience has changed. In fact, it's gotten a bit younger over the years, right? Because what most people don't understand, even before they got to YouTube, is that when YouTube started, it didn't start as YouTube. It actually started as a dating service called TuneIn Hookup. And when they first started it, it was a video sharing platform so that you could kind of like... Uh, what's the one now? Tinder is the one where you swipe through the pictures. And so YouTube had videos where you could film yourself saying, hey, my name's Brian and I'm really attractive and I drive a Ferrari and I really hope you'll accept me on a date. 
and then the other person would send a video back and blah, blah, blah. Well, YouTube very quickly figured out that the people who were attracted to doing that weren't getting a whole lot of dates, so it wasn't a successful business from a dating perspective. But what they found in the data was that people were consuming huge amounts of these videos, not because the videos were well made, but because they thought that they were funny to watch people try to be awkward and get dates on camera. So YouTube pivoted and then decided, okay, we're gonna now turn this into a video sharing platform where people can just film themselves and put it up on the internet. Fast forward to 2005, now you have YouTube, uh, 2005, 2006. Well, as some of the people I've coached came to the platform long before I ever did, they got to experience those boom years where everything was great and it was confetti and I've got followers and I'm making money and blah, blah, blah. And then 2012 happened and that dried up because YouTube started to really look at data from uh, the television side of the house and how TV companies were making money and now they're wanting to pigeonhole people into different types, into making different types of uh, specific content such that they can run ads on it. A lot of the people that I work with were upset about that because the audience that they once had either wasn't there anymore or was off consuming other content that they thought was more enjoyable. Uh, and then YouTube changed in terms of helping you get your content in front of people. The rules that govern that changed. So many of the creators that I've worked with are frustrated by that. Like, it's my audience abandoned me. It's YouTube changed the way it was working and it completely killed what we were doing in terms of entertainment or business. Some case, cases, people built very large businesses where they employed staff to help them create all this content. And those businesses went out of business because YouTube made a fundamental change. Well, inevitably, the people that I'm working with they bemoan these changes and they're frustrated by them and they wonder why am I no longer getting the success that I once had and the answer is very simple it's that the definition or rather the criteria for success has changed and you were refusing to accept that you're refusing to accept that the audience has gotten younger meaning the way that you communicate with them and the things that they want to consume are not the same as the dating age people who first started on the platform. YouTube no longer promoted content based on the amount of views or the fact, and you could get a ton of views by literally just putting a bikini clad woman with cleavage in the image, and you could get thousands upon thousands of views. And then once those views came in, YouTube's like, well, this video is doing well, let's keep promoting it. YouTube changed that too. They're like, we don't care how many views you get, we care how long you actually keep somebody's attention and how long they stay on YouTube. Well, you have two options. You can complain that this is the way the situation is and just be mad for the rest of your life and no longer have success. Or you can accept that this is what it is now. It's not what it was back in 2006. It's not even what it was back in 2012. Once you accept that that's what it is, it's an interesting thing that happens in your brain once you accept something. And it's relief. It's really interesting. Even when you have to accept something that's stressful or traumatic, the minute your brain says, okay, this is the way it is and no amount of my whining, fussing, kicking, scratching, clawing is going to change it. It is what it is. Now your brain can go into opportunity mode and that's the opportunity for creating solutions to this new problem that you have. So if you're facing, for example, an issue where you're not getting success in your career, there's probably something about your current job or your current chain of command or whatever it is you're doing that you're not accepting. In other words, they're look, the people who control your ability to make more money, your ability to get promoted or whatever, they are looking for certain criteria in your behavior as an employee or your production that you're not hitting the mark on. And maybe you started with the company and it got bought out. Right, And now the criteria has changed. Well, we don't care about people doing this anymore. Maybe you went from a business where it focused very heavily on your ability to, ability to produce. Maybe your company got bought out by a company that cared a lot more about how things look on the surface. I worked in a place like that where the big boss wanted us, instead of actually doing our job, I thought it was the stupidest thing in the world. But our big boss, the guy in charge of everything, when he would do site visits, he wanted it to look like we were busy, meaning we needed to be on our feet walking around. But our actual job was to care for the children. In this case, I worked at a before and after school program. 
Our job was to care for the kids who were there, help them get through their homework, tutor them if necessary. But when we were sitting and tutoring children to the big boss, it looked like we weren't busy. It looked like we were just sitting and hanging out and playing cards. Well, it wasn't true. We were helping these kids learn. But the big boss decided that that superficial appearance was way more important than us actually doing work. Because he, his thought was when parents come in, you should look busy. Because that makes it look like we're doing things. And he, frankly, he cared more about how things looked than how things actually were. Now, I had two options. I could continue to bemoan that and be upset about it and be like, oh, this is stupid. Why, as the boss, does he not understand that we're doing way more of a service to these kids and their parents if we're actually helping them than if we're walking around pretending to be busy? I had, now, the option I chose was to continue helping the kids because I didn't care. <laughs> You know, I accepted this is the way he wants it. I'm just going to accept that he and I are going to have a disagreement. It was a temporary job for me anyway. And I had a relationship with him where, frankly, I felt comfortable telling him, and this is kind of the good side of it, I felt comfortable telling him, hey, dude, this isn't the way to do it, and you know better. Like, on my, on my watch, I'm going to help the kids. And he never really had an issue with me. He knew I was a high performer. He didn't really sweat it too much. But you may be in a situation where you don't have that leeway and you have two options. You can either accept the way it is and start to perform the way they want you to. Or in some cases, what you really need to be able to do is position yourself to leave. You know, Peter Drucker says, and if I have the book handy, I'll actually read it to you. I'll show it to you here. This is, this is one of my favorite books. This is probably like my second favorite book besides the Bible. And it's a very simple book. Nothing in here is very complicated. It's a book called Managing Oneself. If you're watching this on the website, I'll have links where you can go and purchase this. I want to actually read to you about values. Let's see. We have Where Do I Belong? I think it actually comes. Oh, What Are My Values? So Peter Drucker, and if you don't know who Peter Drucker is, he's essentially... Uh, the Albert Einstein of the business world. So Peter says, to be able to manage yourself, you finally have to ask, what are my values? This is not a question of ethics. He goes on to say, and this is the important part, to work in an organization whose value system is unacceptable or incompatible with one's own condemns a person both to frustration and non-performance. Let me read that again, because that is really profound. To work in an organization whose value system is unacceptable or incompatible with one's own condemns a person both to frustration and to non-performance. In other words, if your values and your company's values are in disagreement, <laughs> you are not going to be a productive member of this organization. Right? You're going to be miserable, first of all. You're going to be frustrated, he says, and you're not going to perform because you are going to be wanting to do things in a different fashion than the company wants you to. If you saw, whenever you may be watching this, I'm recording this uh, weeks after it happened, but you may be watching this years after. There's a gentleman by the name of James Damore who was fired from Google for circulating a, a kind of a manifesto 10 page memo that he had written about how Google handles diversity and what he believes in an effective way. Now, there were claims about whether what he wrote was intentionally sexist. I'm not really, I can't judge the morality of it. But the fact of the matter is when you read what he wrote, you very quickly begin to understand that he did not share Google's values. So even though he was fired and Allegedly, he wasn't fired for making sexist statements. He was fired for breaching the company's um, policy, kind of their code of conduct. Uh, and I read his whole entire 10-page document. You know, I have my own thoughts about whether it was evil or whatever, but that's not important. What's important is the document made it very clear that he was in violent disagreement with how Google managed diversity and its values surrounding diversity and how Google was a company that would suppress the voices of people that disagreed with their values. Well, of course they will. <laughs> if, if I have a specific set of values and you're the opposite, you need to not be in my company, which is what happened. So my advice to him would have been, if I had been coaching him, was you don't need to write a 10-page manifesto because that's not going to go over well. You need to start looking for other employment and find another place to be that does share your values in the way that you do business. And I think that's very true for all of us. You know, in your career, if you're not seeing the success you want, 
in some way, shape, or form, that's tied back to you accepting that something is off, right? And sometimes the decisions that you need to make are to walk away from the situation, not to continue to be frustrated. You need to accept that the company has a way of doing things and you have a way of doing things. And what I watch and what I've even tried to do, I'll tell you a story about kind of the darkest point in my career here in a second. What I've watched people try to do and even try to do myself is you try to adapt yourself to this thing that you violently disagree with and then you basically become frustrated and maybe even depressed in the process. And really what it comes down to is like my mentor said, freedom is the key, or excuse me, acceptance is the key to my freedom. My freedom is 100% dependent upon my acceptance of the situation. I remember weeks before going to war, being stressed, like not knowing what to expect. I talked to some of my mentors uh, who were in the unit with me who had been in combat before, who could kind of give us a taste of what we should experience when we get there. But not, you know, when you don't know, you haven't experienced it yourself, you're, you're doing the best you can in your mind. And I remember being stressed and having a lot of anxiety about not just me being in harm's way, but being responsible for other people and taking them into harm's way. And, and this kind of fear gripped me of, I, I feared and dreaded potentially having to tell a wife or a mother or a child why their husband or son or dad had been killed under you know my command, basically. And that stressed me out for a long time. But it was interesting, several days before we actually went to combat, I don't know, I can't really fathom or explain what it was. It was kind of like, almost like, God's spirit just came to rest on me and to bring a, a level of peace into my, my existence to say, look, this is what's going to go down is what's going to go down. And you fussing and whining and being, in my case, being depressed and anxious about it isn't necessarily, in fact, that's going to put you at a greater risk of having something happen if you don't get that under control. You know, it's kind of like uh, if you're a Bible reader you've heard the the scripture that says god grants you the peace that surpasses all understanding and it did i had this weird sense of peace that just was it was just one more i remember i was standing on the side of one of our armored vehicles and i was shaving and there was a news crew walking around and just doing their thing and i just remember sitting there like i'm so stressed about this thing but it was just like that you know it basically i think the whole scripture is um you know, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, in your prayers, and when you make your request to God, um, be thankful. And the the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind. And that's that's the whole scripture. And I remember that's exactly what happened. It was this unexplainable, irrational feeling of peace with, it's just going to be all right. Whatever happens. It's going to be all right. And I remember I finished shaving and I just was peaceful the rest of the time, like visibly to myself and to others. And what I really attribute it back to is accepting. Like I had to finally, because I rebelled in my mind for over a year about going into this war. I didn't want to be there. I thought the um, kind of the reasons we were going in there weren't necessarily altogether altruistic. And I wrestled with it and I rebelled and I pray, I pray daily, like, God, find a way to make this not happen because I'm not having it. <laughs> and God was like, yeah, I get that you're not having it, brother, but there's things, there's forces at work here that are bigger than you. And I just remember that day where I was finally like, all right, God, cool. This has to happen. Give me the strength and the wisdom to keep my men safe. And I say men because I was in charge. I was in command of men. We didn't have any... Uh, Actually, we did end up having a lady that joined us on my team. She was an intelligence um, soldier who came to help us during the war. But she wasn't actually a part of my specific unit, but that's <laughs> semantics. But I just remember saying, all right, God, if this has got to go down, let's get it done. Give me the wisdom and the strength to help these men get through this alive and well and to accomplish our mission. And as soon as I accepted 
that whatever is getting ready to take place is going to take place and all I can control is my participation and my attitude in the situation, peace. It was just serenity that I can't even explain it to you. But that serenity, I have no question in my mind that serenity, the roots of that serenity was my ability to accept that I was no longer in control of the situation. No amount of praying or wishing was going to force the earth to behave the way that I wanted it to in that specific situation. And that acceptance, it set me free. And it's funny because when my mentor said that to me several years later, when I was rebelling against another thing, you know, sometimes we're, sometimes we're a little, sometimes I'm a little slow to learn. It didn't make sense right away. But then when I thought back to the story I'm sharing with you, it was like, oh, that's what she's talking about. She's talking about the freedom comes from when you accept that you're no longer in control. And if you're a Bible, God-believing person like me, it's like, well, God's in control overall of the situation. There's certain things that we have dominion over. But at the end of the day, what's going to go down is what's going to go down. I can only control my participation and my attitude. Let's go get it done. Let's have the attitude that I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that my men come home alive and well and that we accomplish the mission. And that's exactly what we did. It's exactly what we did. So that peace, that mental freedom came once I finally accepted I'm no longer in control of stopping this war from happening as if I ever had any control over that in the first place. I'm no longer in control over the decisions that my leaders make. I'm really only in control of the decisions I make as a leader and making sure that I'm doing everything I can to protect my people. And once I accepted that, like I said, it was this unexplainable, intangible, irrational sense of serenity. I mean, I literally was walking into or driving into a place where people were going to be trying to drop bombs, shoot RPGs and fire small arms at me. And I was totally like, all right, let's get it on. You know, I liken it to if you're a football player, or you play any sport where you get really, really nervous before a game. But I remember when I played football after the first catch or the first tackle, I was in. I was no longer nervous. I was like, all right, we're in. Let's go. And that's because you accept it. I'm on the field and all I can control right now in this moment is my next right action. And so <clears throat> how can you apply what I'm talking about to your personal life, to your professional life, to your relationships and to your happiness? What's going on? And you can definitely make this a part of your homework. You guys have to forgive me. My allergies are making my nose itch like crazy. Um, <laughs> what is going on in your life that's causing frustration and unhappiness in any area and what have you not accepted what about the situation are you still trying to maintain some level of control over when you are not the person who's in control right and when you can come to grips with you can't control that example i gave in the beginning about the boss that wanted to do stupid stuff and believe me that wasn't the last story about a boss doing stupid stuff Companies do stupid stuff all the time. I've done stupid stuff as a boss. Really stupid stuff sometimes. <laughs> to the point where I actually, well, I wasn't a boss in that particular case, but there was a situation where I was leading a group and ended up getting somebody hurt because of my stupidity. So, you know, I'm not judging anybody, but are you not accepting that your boss wants you to do the stupid thing? Because once you accept it, then you can do one of two things. You can say, okay, I'll do the stupid thing for now until I can find another place to be which is probably the right answer. But then you don't have to be miserable. Like you don't have to come in every day like, oh, here we go again with the stupidity. Like, yes, accept and expect the thing that you're calling stupidity is going to happen. And once you do, you have a lot more peace because you're expecting it. You're not hoping every day that you're gonna go in and then everyone's just gonna be different because you've accepted the situation as it is. And that's really powerful. I mean, like going back to what Peter Drucker was saying about values, where you know one of my values as a business owner for example is i don't wear suits you know when i do videos like this i see a lot of coaching where people put a suit on and stand over you know in front of a whiteboard like the one i have this just off camera here they're not wearing baseball caps and sweaters right but this is my value system my value is i never want to have a job where i have to wear a suit because i enjoy being comfortable and i enjoy having conversation with people that's way more personal than wearing a suit. Now, obviously there are situations where I have to wear suits, like inevitably my business 
ventures will probably carry me to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange where I believe wearing suits is required. There's certain speaking engagements that I know I have coming up where the requirement is to wear a suit. So I'm not going to go in there with my sweater on and be like, I'm doing it my way. I'm going to accept that that's the way they want it if I want to be a part of it and adapt and adjust. But as long as I'm in control, like when you're on my show, this is what you're going to see. You know, and what my hope is, is that people don't look at this and assume, oh, it's unprofessional because they're wearing baseball caps. No, not at all. This is more professional than half or 90% of the people you'll see wearing suits that don't know what they're talking about in selling programs, right? So acceptance is the key to your freedom. What areas of your life have you not accepted as they are? Let's talk about health for a second. Have you not accepted the fact that you're overweight and that you maybe don't look as good as you want to? And perhaps that's even affecting your relationships if you're single. Maybe you need to accept the fact that you could stand to be in better shape. You could stand to get rid of some of that belly fat. You could stand to, you could stand to lose a few LBs, maybe get a little bit stronger, and then watch yourself become more attractive to someone else that you're interested in. And by the way, I'm not criticizing you if you're overweight at all. What I'm saying is, first of all, being overweight is unhealthy. So it makes great sense for you to accept, okay, overweight, and I need to accept that I need to change habits that have led to being overweight that will make me not overweight. You know, same thing in your relationships. Have you refused to accept that maybe that boyfriend or that girlfriend you have is crazy? And I know crazy is kind of a stereotypical dismissive term, but maybe they are. Maybe you need to accept that this relationship is going nowhere and no amount of you, and I work with a lot of people outside of this program, like in my marriage program, and even in the free coaching that I do, where they're hanging on to these relationships because they believe that they're the Jesus Christ of the relationship and they're gonna save this person. You're not saving anybody from anything. People have to choose to be different and most people don't. Most people don't. So you've been in a relationship seven years, this person is still verbally or heaven forbid physically abusive and you're hoping and trying to hold on to the situation, hoping and trying to control it into being different. That doesn't make any sense at all. It makes zero sense. You can't control how that person acts. You can control leaving though and saying I'm and making a decision that I'm never going to settle for another person that doesn't have my best interests at heart. Acceptance is the key to your freedom. You want to be free emotionally and spiritually and physically. You want to be free in your career to pursue the things that are important to you, your values and the goals and the ambitions that you have. You want to be free in your relationships. You want to be free to have a relationship that actually makes you happy for crying out loud, right? Well, to do that, you have to accept certain things about the circumstances that you find yourself in. And I'd say one of the biggest things that we have to accept, and I think most human beings are bad at this, myself included, one of the biggest things we have to accept is us. We have to accept us just the way we are instead of trying to force ourselves to be this phony superficial image we have of ourselves. And in most cases, you saw someone else that you wish you were like, and you're trying to fashion yourself after them, but you're not them. You can't be them. I can, there's nothing I can do within my physical control outside of insane plastic surgery, which still wouldn't work. There's nothing I can do to make myself look like Brad Pitt. No matter how much I may want to look like Brad Pitt, there's nothing I can do to make that happen. Absolutely zero things I can do to make myself look like Brad Pitt. So that would be a foolish thing to try to control, right? I have to accept that I look the way I look. I look like a mix between The Rock, Lawrence Fishburne, Will Smith, and Sinbad. I can't change that, right? This is the face that God gave me. Now, I could go get plastic surgery, but why? Instead, I can accept my looks for what they are. I can accept that my disposition in the gym is different from someone else, right? I have friends that can smoke and drink seven days a week and still walk around with six pack abs, even in their thirties. Not me, not this guy. <laughs> I gotta go to the gym and eat right every day if I wanna have six pack abs. Am I gonna be mad? Oh, why? It's not fair that they're able to do it. No, I just accept that that's the way it is for me. And if six pack abs is a legitimate goal that I have, 
that I need to be disciplined in order to get them. Because I didn't get the six-pack abs genetics. I got the genetics that say if you want six-pack abs, you have to work for it. But until I accept that, until I accept that as my reality, there's literally nothing I can do to change the way I look until I accept how I look. And really, I'd say I'd take it even a step further than acceptance, appreciation, like appreciating your looks and your physicality, right? Appreciating your personality, that's another huge one that people work so hard. I, I can't tell you how many people I run into that are upset because they're introverted. You know, if being introverted is even really a thing. <laughs> but they're shy, like, I wish I wasn't shy. Why? You know, it, for the ways that we've come to measure personality, in fact, there's been statistical studies that were done, which I can't link to you because I haven't read them. I heard somebody else say this on a TEDx talk. <laughs> but the bottom line was that, and I believe the person that was talking, they said that statistically, introverts were more efficient than extroverts. and. In the general sense, they're often more successful than extroverts, even though being extroverted and outgoing is celebrated. And it, it, they had literally, there's self help courses on how to be more outgoing. Why? You weren't made outgoing. You weren't made to get energy from being around people. You were made to get energy in solitude. You want to know what that means? You're going to be an excellent planner. You're going to be able to sit in a room in the silence and figure out your next move on the chessboard to succeed a lot easier than a big-headed extroverted person like I could. I have to work at that. You have the genetics that allow you to sit down and map out the chess moves. I have the genetics that make me force myself to sit down and plan them out while I'm jittery like, ooh, squirrel, right? We have to accept who we are. And I got a bit of advice from a friend who was working on a team that I was leading several years ago uh, and I, many of you, if you've been around me for a while, you've heard me tell the story of when I first, when I first started earning six figures many, many years ago uh, in my life. And I remember originally being excited that I was gonna get the opportunity and then it ended up literally being the worst job I'd ever had in my life. Like by, by a large margin, it was the worst thing I'd ever done. You know, worse than working at a music store, worse than jumping into a trash compactor at Burlington Coat Factory. Yeah, I did that because the trash compactor wasn't working. Or sorry, the recycling compactor, not the trash compactor. Our general manager made us jump on the boxes because the compactor didn't work anymore. Inside the compactor, by the way. Or what I said about stupid bosses. When I first took that job, I was excited because it was... In my mind, it was a job that I could do in my sleep, especially after coming off the years of experience I'd had as a combat leader and a senior leader in Fortune 500 world. This job was just kind of a one-off, you do a thing, you do these reports, blah, 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 this, you do it in your sleep. So I was excited about making a lot of money and not really being taxed because I was also building my business. It was literally the worst job I'd ever had. I had people there that treated me not intentionally, like it wasn't racism, so let me be clear. But they treated me as if slavery had just ended and I had just learned to read. And I'm not even, I'm barely exaggerating. Like they were so taken aback that I actually had the talents that I had. Like, oh my God, how did you learn? How, like, are you freaking kidding me? And then so they just relegated me to these tasks that frankly, I could teach my oldest child to do easily. And it was frustrating. And then they never really gave me opportunities to show my skills. And then, you know, as the leadership changed and people changed, they made it even worse. It was like this, they wouldn't even let me do the job I was supposed to be doing. I basically just became an errand boy. A very well paid errand boy, by the way, so no complaints. But complaints because I am built to do more than this. Give me an opportunity to show you that I can win at things. And what I finally came to grips with one day I was frustrated. I'd been doing it for a couple of years. Leadership wasn't listening to me, you know, and which was interesting to me because I had led organizations larger than most of them were currently leading. And they wouldn't listen to me about the problems we were having with our customers, et cetera, et cetera. And I just went back to my desk disheveled. And my buddy, this guy named Dennis, guy I love greatly, he just looked at me, he's like, um, 
Hey, B. I said, what's up, dude? He's like, when are you going to stop trying to convince these idiots that you're smart? And that hit me like a ton of bricks because he was exactly right about I was trying to show these people that I had talents and it was just like basically talking to a it'd be the equivalent of me talking to a horse. <laughs> just like not having it, right? He's like, at some point, dude, you have to accept the fact that you don't belong here. You're trying to make a place for yourself. And he's like, and I've watched you. This company has these values, you have these values, and you've been trying to adapt yourself to fit into the company. It's like, I'm here to tell you that's never gonna happen. You have to accept that you don't belong here. You have to accept that you cannot, this is a fight that you can't win. And I'm paraphrasing, he didn't say all this, but this was my takeaway. You have to accept the fact that you don't fit with this company's values. You were raised, and he didn't mean in my career, he knew about my background as a child. He's like, you were raised as a warrior and a leader. You get to be none of those things here. You get to be exactly zero of those things in this organization. And you're in an organization that wants to take the easy way out. They wanna do the minimum level of work to make people happy so they can get paid, go home, and have parties on the weekends. He's like, does that, and he wasn't saying all this, but again, this was my takeaway. And I had to ask myself, is that really what I wanted to be? I wanted to ally myself with a company that wouldn't do the hard, they wouldn't do the right thing because it was hard. And they would just continue to want to do the easy things. And then, and then be frustrated that they weren't getting the results that they wanted. And then look at me like I'm crazy when I tell them, hey guys, I've run a couple of companies at this point. The reason why we suck is this and blah, blah, blah. You know, I could, I could beat the story to death. The point was, I made a decision to go against my own values, which my values were always put yourself in a position to affect significant positive change for the people that are around you, whether that's in business relationships or whatever. I put that on the shelf to go after a six figure salary because I thought that would be good for my family. What I didn't know going into it is that it wouldn't be good for my family because it ripped me apart. It put me in places of depression that even war didn't do. And so I had to accept myself. I had to accept that I couldn't change that organization. I had to accept that I couldn't change me to fit inside of that organization. And once I came to grips with the fact that I needed to do that, it honestly wasn't that hard. You know, it got easier, not 100%. Eventually, I moved on, and everybody was happy. They were glad to see me go, <laughs> and I was definitely glad to go. But had I been more in tune with my values before I took that job, uh, you know, and I was in a place where my family, frankly, needed the money. So... I don't know that I would have done it differently with the knowledge that I have now because my family had to eat. But I would have approached it differently. I wouldn't have tried to control so much. I would have gone in accepting and expecting that these people are going to behave this way just so I could have a level of peace. And it would have been a very temp, like I would have made it a very temporary thing. And I mean, I, it, it, it actually is a good thing because it's what led me to get really serious about my company and start building my company and building these products that you're consuming now. And so, if I can really encourage you with anything, it's acceptance is the key to your freedom. Whether it's in your professional career, your relationships, your health, your general happiness. Accepting the world as it is right now today is what's necessary if you ever want to change it tomorrow. Because by the way, I'm not saying that things can't change. They can but you have to focus on what you are capable of changing and accept the fact that things are the way they are. You know, I think it's, can't remember which famous person said this, whether it was Joel Salatin that says, you know, in order to change the thing, you have to be intimately familiar with why it is the way it is. You can't change something if you don't know why it's the way it is. So my encouragement to all of you is to understand that whatever you're going through, whether you're in a crappy job, accept it. 
accept that. And, and here's the deal. Here's what I want you to do. Let's talk practicals. I've, I've been talking really high level. Let's, let's get down into the nitty gritty, right? Accept the fact that you hate the job and be okay with that. Stop trying to adapt yourself and your friends are telling you, well, if you just adapt your attitude, you can learn to love it. No, if you hate it, especially if it's for one of the, if it's for the reason we talked about in the book, you're just, your values are being trampled on or you're being disrespected. Like I was like, I was professionally pissed on daily <laughs> in that job that I told you about, except the fact that you hate it and let that be okay. You don't need to put on some false humility. I need to be grateful. At least I have a job. Yeah, of course you need to be grateful, but that doesn't mean you continue to sign up for abuse because you're grateful that you're not homeless. In fact, if you're single, being homeless might even be better because it'll propel you <laughs> to go actually do what you need to do. And then accept the fact that you don't fit there. Right? Accept the fact that whatever's making you hate it, might might mean that you just need to move on it also may mean that may mean that you need to grow up like if you hate every job you've ever had well one of two things are true either you're supposed to own your own business or you need an attitude adjustment or in some cases probably both right so it's a matter of maturity and being able to accept things as they are and accepting the fact that you're unhappy being okay with that and not judging yourself or criticizing yourself for being unhappy, allowing that unhappiness and that pain, accepting that you're hurting so that it can propel you to a place where you aren't hurting, right? Except, like I told you in the examples, that your bosses are doing stupid things and you have no power whatsoever to change that. Unless you're in charge. I mean, I've been in jobs where I was in charge, so I didn't have a lot of those problems because I'm the one that could change them. But if you're not in that position, then you just need to accept that that's the way it is. And if you don't have the means to negotiate a way where you and the company can be happy, then you need to be looking for another place to be. Let's talk about relationships. If you're in a bad relationship or if you're in no relationship and you're looking to have one, you need to accept it. You need to accept the things that are creating the tension or the badness in your relationship. Is it that the person you're with is abusive or is it that you're immature and you need to grow up and not be so jealous and judgmental? Maybe you need to be more trusting. Maybe the other person needs to learn how to be more trusting. Are they willing to be that? Because if they're not, then you just accept it. Stop trying to change them and you move on. Seven point, what, eight billion people on the planet? You'll be fine, okay? Like, it's not the one. <laughs> they're not the one, believe me. And you're not gonna turn them into the one by any amount of effort on your part to control or shape them into the person you want them to be. It's just not gonna happen. Accept the fact that it's bad. Accept the fact that you're unhappy. And accept the fact that something needs to change. Whether it's you leaving, it's you adjusting and becoming more mature if you're with someone that's really good and you're the problem, or vice versa if they're the problem but they have potential to be amazing and they're willing, by the way, to make themselves that amazing person. Then accept the way it is today and then make the commitment to make the necessary changes or move on. There's at least 7.5 billion people on the planet and at least half of them are, you know, the opposite sex. You know, or, you know, if you're into the same sex thing, the bottom line is there's a lot of people on the planet. You have an opportunity to walk away and still probably run into somebody who can come and play that role in your life. Right? Let's talk about the no relation person. Maybe you want to be in a relationship and you haven't been in a good one for many years. Or you've been kind of in the dating and the physical aspect, but you don't have any of the commitment or the intimacy that comes from people who genuinely have committed to love one another. What needs to change about you? You know, at the end of the day, you attract what you are. So if you're attracting nothing, that doesn't mean you are nothing. It just means what you want to attract, you have not become yet. You know, you want to attract a Demi Lovato? You better be dang handsome, you better be in shape, and you better have some cake, you better have some money, because she has all those things. Do you think a Demi Lovato is going to be attracted to a 30-something 
dude that's living with his parents with like and granted it's not wrong that you're living with your parents if you're grinding and hustling like if you're living with your parents and you're building you know a multi-million dollar company then rock on but if you're living with your parents because you're lazy or complacent or afraid you can't possibly think that you're going to attract Demi or, or Ariana Grande right if you're not Angelina Jolie you're probably not going to attract Brad Pitt right? and I know my pop culture references are a little outdated Clearly, I don't watch a lot of television or consume social media the way most people do. But the point is, you, you're going to attract exactly what you are. In some cases, there's, there's kind of a margin of error there. So in some cases, you'll attract a little bit less than what you are. And in some cases, you can do a little bit better. In my life, I've always tended to be lucky and do a little bit better than I deserve. In some cases, I've done a lot bit better than I've deserved. But... At the end of the day, I'm not going to do stupidly better <laughs> than I deserve. You know what I mean? Well, depending on the circumstance, there's been some times where I've done stupidly better than I deserve. But that's usually the exception to the rule, not the norm. But the point is, if you're not attracting the person you want into your life, look at yourself and ask yourself, if you were them, would you date you? And don't pull the, well, if they knew who I was in my heart. Great. Your heart's awesome. Now use that heart to make everything else about you awesome. Right? Step up your mind game. What are you doing to develop your mind? Look at this bookshelf behind me. See all these books? See all these things? These aren't just decoration for me, friends. I read this stuff. You know why? Because I have to expand my mind. If I want to reach a billion people and fundamentally change the world, the way the world operates and thinks. And if I want to eradicate the spirit of fear that just hovers over the earth and clouds so many people's lives, I need to be smart enough to be able to reach people. You think I'm going to figure that out just sitting down here in my office? No, I need to get information from people way smarter than me, like Richard Dawkins and Leif Bavin, Jocko Willink, right? People like Peter Drucker, Dr. David Buss right here behind me. I've got to do that. I've got to do that. I've got to step my mind game up. If I want to attract, you know, I'm currently very happily married, so I'm not trying to attract anybody, but if I want to keep my wife attracted to me, she's attracted to me spiritually, of course. She's attracted to me psychologically, of course, because I'm well-developed in those areas. But if I want her to be physically attracted to me, I can't walk around with the giant beer belly, yo. I got to hit the weights. I got to run a lap. I got to do some push-ups. I have to eat like a regular person and not eat myself into crazy overweightness. And if that's you, hear me, I'm not making fun of you or criticizing you. I'm saying what will hopefully motivate you to improve those areas of your life, to really dive in deep and understand why you're this way and then accept it. It starts with accepting that you're not those things yet. You know, you want Demi Lovato? Cool. And I don't even know if she's married or has a boyfriend. I don't, I don't care. But you want somebody like that? Look at yourself. Do you think you're the type of person, and I don't care about your heart, I get that you're a nice person. Everybody can be a nice person. I needed some water so I don't start coughing from all this talking. <clears throat> Is everything about you, including your heart, something that should attract a girl like that? And don't be delusional. Don't believe the stuff your mother said that you're beautiful just the way you are. You are not physically. You may be spiritually and emotionally. But if you want to attract someone that's really physically attractive, chances are you probably should be really physically attractive yourself. And sure, attractiveness is in the eye of the beholder. I'm not one to judge. I mean, women who the world thinks are beautiful, I'm like, okay, they ain't got nothing on my wife. And I'm sure most of the world would disagree with me. I'm cool with that. So yeah, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. But what are you doing to develop yourself? Because part of the, you looking good and having six-pack abs, if that's even realistic for you and being in shape, is not just about physically attracting someone. It's sending psychological cues. It's sending cues to a woman, hey, this is a person who takes care of themselves. It's not just about physical attraction. Physical attraction is rooted in biology, right? Physical attractiveness sends a cue to a potential mate that says, hey, this is a person who's healthy and takes care of themselves, so my desire to continue my genes and DNA through having a child with them potentially, 
and I get some of you are just dating, but the end game, the fact that they're healthy and take care of themselves means they'll be around to help take care of this child, right? It's not just superficial. Physical attractiveness is not just superficial. So look at it that way. Would someone who's clearly physically attractive and takes care of themselves be attracted to someone who looks like they don't? You know, don't be delusional about it. If you're overweight, screw it. it but accept it. You don't need to run from it or deny it or suck your gut in when you're at the pool. Accept it. Because when you accept it, then you can start taking the necessary actions to change it. Career. You accept that your boss is crazy or does stupid things. Well, now you can start taking the actions necessary to change that reality. You can either find a new job. You can either rise above your boss and go do something else, maybe within the company. If it's a company that you believe in, you can start your own company. There's so many things that you can do to address the situation, but you won't start until you accept that the situation is what it is and that you physically cannot necessarily change that circumstance. You can only change your behaviors and your attitudes around it. Relationships, right? You don't have anybody or the person you have is somebody you need to drop. Accept it. Because once you accept it, you accept the fact that you are greatly overweight or let's say, let's, let's get off weight and looks for a second. Let's talk about emotional stability. Maybe you're not completely 100% emotionally stable. You deal with depression and social anxiety, asocial tendencies, or heaven forbid, antisocial tendencies. Okay. If you do, you don't need to lie about it to yourself, right? You don't need to deny it. Accept it because then you can make the decisions to go get the necessary help. You can go seek out professional help. And they can either prescribe different behaviors and mindsets, right? Being in this program is a part of that. You're going to learn a lot of mindsets in this program that are going to help you beat your mind into shape so that you can behave in the way that actually gets you what you want. That's what this program is really all about, is shaping the mind so that you can take the, you can get over the blocks that are in here and the limiting beliefs that are keeping you from where you want to be and start using this tool for what it was created to do, which is to simulate and then create the reality that we wanna live in. And I know that's a little bit higher level, we'll get into some of those details in the future videos. But accept the fact that you may have some of these issues so that you can start making the necessary decisions and taking the necessary actions to fix it, right? Your health, maybe you are overweight, maybe you're underweight, right? Good, accept it, because now you can make the necessary decisions to start eating properly, to start exercising, right? Or maybe you have some type of disability, accept it, because now you can start making decisions in your life to work around the skills and the abilities that you still have even though you're disabled. I mean, look at Stephen Hawking, look at what he's been able to accomplish with his condition where he basically <laughs> can't even move. Look at what he's accomplished. That's pretty, that's pretty tremendous, I'd say. Because he accepted his reality and he moved on. You know, he accepted the things that he can control, right? So acceptance is ultimately the key to our freedom. And I would argue, I would add to what my mentor said, and I would add that acceptance is the key to our happiness. And at the end of the day, you got into this program, whether you got here for free, you know, in our, in our test group where I just gave it to people for free to test it out and see if it was amazing to them, or you came in maybe as a disabled wounded warrior, disabled veteran, uh, you know, all my programs are free to those folks. Uh, or I guess I should say us folks. <laughs> um, you know, if you came in, you purchased it after it went on sale to the public because it was open to other groups before I made it public. Regardless of how you got here, the reason why you're watching this video is because you want to be happy. You want someone to help you understand the things you need to know and the things that you need to do so that you can have some semblance of happiness in your life. Or maybe a big semblance of happiness in your life. And a lot of that happiness is going to be rooted in you making progress toward, matter of fact, I'll share another book with you. This is kind of jumping ahead to other lessons, but you know, I love to give more value than I charge for. A lot of our happiness, and this is the book, The Happiness Hypothesis by Dr. Jonathan Haidt. This is an amazing book. I need to reread this again. But 
Dr. Height would argue that our happiness is rooted in us making progress toward a goal or a thing that we actually want to happen. Right? So... When you're making progress towards something you want is when you're at your happiest. You know, most people, I, I listen to my family say this all the time because they still have what I call the, the lottery mentality, like fortune will smile upon them and then they'll ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after, not realizing that the grind is actually what makes you happy. You know, most people try to get away from the grind <laughs> in their lives and in their careers. Well, the reason why they're trying to get away from the grind is not because of the grind, it's because what they're grinding they don't like. Um, it's the grind, it's the climb that makes us, that sees us at our happiest. Oh, well, this is a perfect <laughs> segue. Uh, more research finds that most people approach their work in one of three ways, as a job, a career, or a calling. Uh, if you see work as a job, you do it only for the money. You look at the clock frequently while dreaming about the weekend ahead. And you probably pursue hobbies, which satisfy your, your affectance uh, needs more thoroughly than does your work. If you see your work as a career, you have larger goals of advancement, promotion, and prestige. The pursuit of these goals often energizes you. And you sometimes take work home with you because you want to get the job done properly. Yet, at times you wonder why you work so hard. You might occasionally see your work as a rat race where people are competing for the sake of competing. If you see your work as a calling, however, you find your work intrinsically fulfilling. You are not doing it to achieve something else. You see your work as contributing to the greater good or as playing a role in some larger enterprise, the worth of which seems obvious to you. That perfectly describes why I created the 69 Pillars of Success why I have the marriage experience, why I run the Social Media Ninja Academy, why I'm building the Career Builder Program, why I do daily coaching on the internet, and then weekly live coaching, and then I do monthly live coaching with clients. The reason why I do that is not for promotion or prestige. It's not so that people can know my name. And it's not for the money. Because I'll tell you, when I first started it, the money really wasn't all that good. Money eventually comes, and it comes uh, in droves. That's not why I do it. Because trust me, if I were doing it for the money, I never would have gotten out of the first year I started running my own business. Because you, you lose money usually. Actually, my first year in business, I made 50 bucks. And I got yelled at by my accountant <laughs> because I did not understand how to run a business properly. <laughs> but it's a, it's a valuable lesson. But the point is, you're in this program because you want to figure out how do I reverse engineer this existence so that I can be happy? How do I even know what happiness is and define it for myself and then pursue the things that get me toward it? At the end of the day, that's really what it's all about. You know, Sigmund Freud, I don't know if I have the book up here on my shelf, in his book, Civilization, Civilization and Its Discontents, talks about that really, the purpose of our existence at the end of everything is to be happy. Even though my purpose is to change lives and to spread a message that fundamentally changes the way the world thinks and to eradicate fear, that's the purpose. But the underlying piece of that is it makes me really happy to make life better for people. It just does. And we're at our happiest when we're making progress toward a goal. Not when we achieve it, by the way. That's why I laugh at my family. Again, that was The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Heider. I have links uh, on the website description and on the Facebook page, wherever you may be watching this, where you can purchase these books uh, from Amazon. But uh, my family thinks that, oh, I'm going to win the lottery and everything's going to be amazing. We'll have millions of dollars. I'll give you $10 million. I'll give you $10 million. I'll give you $10 million. I'm going to give the babies $10 million. And you get $10 million just for being here. And then we're going to buy a beach. And then we're going to live at the beach and build a house on the beach. And it's just like, what they don't understand is... Uh, what psychology calls the contrast bias. <laughs> uh, and basically our mind has several cognitive biases that we live with that somewhat determine the way we behave and think. And what happens is once you make that $300 million, after about a month, and I think Jonathan Haidt talks about it, it's about a month, <laughs> you'll be really, really happy and then you'll be like, mm, I wish I had a billion. 
This Ferrari is not as nice as my neighbor's Ferrari that's a billionaire. It's just the way the human mind is wired. And so it's one of the reasons why I don't want to win the lottery because I feel like it'll take some of my fight. Now, actually, for me, it wouldn't. I would win the lottery and immediately deploy the money towards taking over the world faster. But most people don't have that, right? So it's like they're just hoping, oh, I hope they call my number so I can be rich and I don't have to work for it. But they don't realize that at the end of that, they're going to be happy for about a month. And then they realize, oh. Just having the money and the material isn't where the happiness actually comes from. Now, the happiness, the money can buy freedom, which will make you insanely happy. But if you are not rooted, like if you don't have a thing in your life that really compels you to act, that sense of purpose, that sense of calling, as Jonathan Haidt called it, I think you'd find yourself pretty disappointed after becoming a multimillionaire. You'd be happy for a little while. I think, which jeweler was it? Was it De Beers that when he was sailing across the world finding diamonds and he had basically become the richest jeweler ever in the history of the earth. I think he jumped off his boat and killed himself because it was like, now what do I do? I have nothing else to compete for. Uh, and I'm not saying if you win the lottery, you're gonna jump off your boat, but my point is your happiness is gonna come from working on the things that are working toward what you wanna see. So don't be delusional about the things that aren't the way you like them. Don't lie about them, don't deny them accept them and then make the necessary decisions take the necessary actions that are going to move you step by step by step by step to the future and to the reality that you want to see and that my friends is legitimately the only way to shape the world in the image that you want to see it i hope you got a lot out of this discussion friends thank you so much for watching thank you for being a part of the 69 pillars of success here. I really pray that you're getting more out of this than you put into it financially. I hope you're able to turn, you know, whatever you paid to get here, whether it was free or otherwise, that you're able to turn it into a hundredfold of a blessing for you spiritually, physically, and financially, uh, and emotionally in your life. Now, your homework is to go back and do what I said about halfway through the video where I said, I want you to identify a part of your life that isn't the way you want it and determine and by the way, I give you these exercises not to give you busy work. It's going to help the lesson and the principle be solidified in your mind. The Bible calls this writing it on the tablet of your heart, writing. So I want you to write out what is the situation in your life that isn't the way you want it to be and how is your lack of acceptance caused it and then what are you going to do to change it? And I'll say that one more time. First question, identify an area of your life, and it could be a very specific thing, that's not the way you want it to be. Job, relationship, lack of a relationship, health. What part of it is on your shoulders? In other words, how has your lack of acceptance, your delusion, your denial caused this situation to still be existing in your life? And three, what are the steps that you're going to take to set your mind in the right direction and to get your actions lining up with changing that reality? I love you all very much. Remember that we are stronger than I. And I'll see you on the next step.